To derive the velocity as a function of time, we start with the definition of the acceleration in one dimension. We then rearrange to get the velocity differential on the left, and then we integrate both sides, keeping in mind that we're dealing here with a constant acceleration. On the right-hand side, the acceleration has come out of the integral since it's constant. And we've integrated from time zero, the initial time, to time t. On the left-hand side, the limits of integration correspond to those on the right. V sub x zero is the velocity component at time zero. V sub x is the velocity component at time t. We now perform the integration, and then we rearrange to get our result. To sum up, the x component of the velocity at time t is equal to the initial x, com x velocity component at time zero, plus how much the velocity changes from time zero to time t. Let's resize this and get it out of the way. To derive the position as a function of time, with, for motion with constant acceleration in one dimension, we start with the corresponding definition of velocity. We put this together with the result we just obtained, then we get dx by itself. We then integrate both sides, keeping in mind again that in this case of interest that we're talking about, constant acceleration, a sub x is constant. Also, v sub x zero is constant because that's the velocity component at time zero. Once you have that, it's fixed. So this term and this term are constant. v sub x zero and a sub x are outside the integrals because they're constants. And on the right-hand side, we're integrating from the initial time, which we're going to call time, we're going to call zero, to time t. On the left-hand side, we've got the corresponding limits x sub 0 is the position at time 0, x is the position at time t. We now do the integral. Note that the integral of dx is just x, the integral of dt is just t, and the integral of dt dt would be t squared over 2. We need to evaluate these at their limits. Finally, rearranging, we have our result. Now let's take stock of what we have here. x is the position at time t. And so the position at time t is equal to the initial position plus the change in position from time 0 to time t. Now looking at this change in position from time 0 to time t, if the acceleration were 0, then this here would represent the change in position from time zero to time t, which makes sense because that would just be velocity times time. And if this were a constant velocity, then the product of that constant velocity times time, elapsed time, would give you the change in position. But of course, if you have an acceleration, this can't be the full story. So all of this gives you the change in position from time zero to time t. Finally, since velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time, we ought to be able to take the time derivative of this expression and get this expression. So here we go. Let's make sure we can do that. The time derivative of x sub 0 is 0. The derivative with respect to time of v sub x 0 times t is just this constant, v sub x 0. And we see that here. The derivative with respect to time of 1 half a sub x times t squared. Well, remember, 1 half a sub x, that's a constant. Derivative of t squared with respect to time. The, t co the 2 comes down, cancels the 1 half. We're left with a sub x t, and we see that right there. So it all checks out. So you ought to be able to go both ways. You ought to be able to go uh, from this expression to this expression by integration. You ought to be able to go back by differentiation. Finally, if you keep this integral derivative relationship in mind, you'll never forget this factor of one-half, because if this factor of one-half weren't there, you would have a mathematical inconsistency between these two equations.